Well, hi everyone and welcome to the genealogy program with Kathy Nelson. And I just wanna start off with just a couple housekeeping rules. Um, I do ask that everyone place themselves on mute while Kathy is talking. And we, um, this way just to help with any distractions. And then also questions, um, please feel free to place any of the questions in the chat and I will read them out to Kathy either at the moment or at the very end, or, at, or we'll have um, some time at the very end of the program for questions for Kathy. Um, so with that being said, Kathy, it's all yours. Thank you, Sean. So I'm gonna go ahead and share um, the screen. Okay, you all are able to see. Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so DNA uh, has really turned genealogy and the world in many ways upside down. And what I thought to do today, I would just share with you an overview of some of the things I've discovered about genealogy and some of the things I've discovered about my family. I there, I will be introducing a number of terms and not really going into depth in a lot of them, but I hope that you'll remember the term and then perhaps pursue this on your own. So welcome to DNA, a key to uncovering your family history. Um, one of those wonderful things that we've been able to do with, um, uh, as genealogists, it's really added to our, uh, to our understanding of our families. So we're gonna look at some DNA test options. We're going to look at some of the companies that offer DNA and talk about um, where the best place would be to start, whatever you're looking for. We're going to talk a little bit about interpreting those results and connecting with cousins, how we're going to do that, and the future of DNA. So obviously a very big topic, but we will um, cover each of these areas. So first, let's start with why DNA? Why are we even doing this? Well, DNA can help us build our family tree. And a lot of us, as we've been doing research with our families have hit brick walls. We can't go any further. And DNA has been able to share with us tips on how to break through those, those um, wonderful brick walls. Um, it helps us identify our ethnicity and any cultural ties that we may have. And some of us may have heard somewhere down the line that we have a Native American in our family tree, a, a Cherokee princess. Maybe we have a Mayflower connection. Maybe we're connected to royalty. Well, DNA can help us prove if that's true or not. Maybe there's health is issues we would like to identify. Maybe we wanna find birth parents. Maybe we're an adoptee and we're interested in, in locating birth parents. And maybe somewhere along the line, because of family circumstances, we've lost siblings, we've lost relatives, and we're looking for them. And of course, we've been hearing in the news about uh, DNA being used to identify human remains, crime victims. That's certainly been in the news the last few years, and war casualties. Uh, Korean uh, remains, Korean War remains and World War II remains are always being discovered and DNA has been a way to link them to their families so that they can be honored and, and buried in, in a proper fashion. So DNA has really helped with that. And of course, more recently, we've been hearing a lot about how DNA is solving criminal cases. And that's, that's pretty exciting use of DNA. Okay, so, um, DNA has revolutionized genealogy. 30 million tests have been taken globally, 30 million. I mean, that's amazing. To the extent that if you are, are of European ancestry in the United States, probably 60% of people in the United States who are of European descent have had their DNA on different DNA testing sites. It may not be them, but it's someone in their family. And if their family has had their DNA tested, then that person is also um, has had their DNA made available. It supports, improves our traditional research and helps us break down those brick walls. It does not lie. So be prepared for some surprises. And through DNA, 
we hope to find cousins who know more about our family history and fill in some of the blanks. Um, everywhere we go with blogs, podcasts, family tree, uh, as genealogists, um, we will find articles on, on, on DNA. Family Tree is a, a magazine, probably one of the pr pr uh, prominent genealogy magazines. And um, I do recommend it if you like, if you're a magazine reader, it is also in an e-version, but um, great Christmas gift or birthday gift. So um, Family Tree always has things on DNA. So what information does DNA provide? Well, okay. yes. Is the, is the screen stuck? Are you not seeing, uh, uh, I, 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 can other people see everything okay? You know what, Kathy, it looks like it's still stuck on Y DNA. Oh, okay. Let's go back. And you can see that? Uh, you know what, nothing has changed. Um, let's try um, unsharing the screen and resharing it. See if we okay. can refresh that. Okay. Thank you, Jim, for catching that. Let's see, let me just get my... Looks like it has something to do with my... Okay. Let me just stop this again. Okay, so what do you see now? Uh, we see your desktop. And then we see that you're on slide three. Okay, so are you seeing Y DNA? Yes. Okay, so let's just get move on ahead to. Uh, th thank you for identifying that problem. Okay, so we talked a little bit about um, DNA and genealogy and how there's 30 million tests taken globally. Um, D DNA does not lie. And we hope to find cousins who can help us fill in the blanks. Okay, now do you see what information does DNA provide? Yes, it looks like it's okay. moving smoothly. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Okay, so DNA gives us information that links us to our ancestors. It connects us to people today who have the same DNA, that is people living today. And it provides a haplogroup. And I find this really interesting. The haplogroup is what gives us a deep information on our ancestors and it tracks the migration of our ancestors from the earliest time. The National Geographic Genographic Project um, uh, was one of the first DNA uh, testing sites and it gave um, the people involved with this project would go into isolated areas um, in Africa, in Asia, groups that were uh, indigenous and take their DNA and then they tracked where that DNA went. And in fact, let's see, um, this is 2008, this map is from 2008. You can see where they got their start in Africa and how they spread out all over the world. The H DNA, which you see up at the top in, in the near Scandinavia and, and up at the Northern part of um, Russia up there, the HDNA and the HV goes into Europe. So if you have an H haplogroup, you are of your very likely of European descent. But National Geographic discontinued this in 2019. But it definitely is very helpful with haplogroups. And some of the testing companies continue to share haplogroups. Show some migratory patterns of, of, our, of our mankind. So DNA is just getting started. Currently, you spit it saliva in a tube or you take a cheek, cheek uh, swab. But the interesting thing is MyHeritage and other companies are now testing artifacts such as an envelope. They're taking the saliva off the lid of an envelope, perhaps written by a great grandparent or a grandparent. They're taking it off a postage stamp, a hat band, glasses, glasses case, 
And this is going to give us an opportunity to obtain the DNA of a grandparent, of a great grandparent um, who have passed on. So this is what's happening in the future. And actually it's happening right now and some people are getting results. So this is something to stay tuned for because we think, oh, I wish I had my parents' uh, DNA. Well, there may be opportunities if you still have a piece of clothing or a letter of your, of your, um, your parents. But we need to remember that DNA is not for the faint of heart. Um, companies all, the testing companies present a disclaimer to not be responsible for the information that you find. And so if you have not taken DNA yet, your test yet, um, there's bound to be surprises and be prepared for that. But two books that I recommend that I found very interesting. One was The Stranger in My Genes, and that's by Bill Griffith. Bill Griffith is a CNBC uh, financial um, uh, journalist. And he has done a lot of work on his family. In fact, he's on the board of the New England Historic Genealogical Society, and he's written books on his family. Well, his first cousin said to him, let's take a DNA test. And he said, sure, because he was very interested in his family history. And he took the DNA test and he found out that his cousin was not his first cousin. And furthermore, his father was not his father. So he began a search for his birth father. And this is a story of him coming to grips with this information. The second book that I really enjoyed reading about is Danny Shapiro, another journalist. And Janny, Danny wrote the book Inheritance. Danny is, a, is a, a, her father is a sperm donor. And she, after taking her DNA test, found out that um, her father, who, who had raised her, was not her birth father. And she begins a search for that family. In searching for that family, um, she does make some connections, some very positive connections. Bill Griffiths decides not to pursue his search. So there's two different um, uh, insights into the process, and you might be interested in those two books. So these are called non-paternal events. And I've had actually three non-paternal events that I found through DNA. And I wanted to share them with you just briefly to give you an idea of the surprises. Um, that come about when you do have your DNA uh, testing done. One situation was a child raised by mother and the birth father did not know the child exist, uh, existed until 38 years later. I have a very large Swedish family. And if I look at my DNA results, many of the Swedes in my family have taken DNA tests. And I go down the list and my probably my first few pages are, are people I know who they are, many of them my first cousins, second cousins. So one day uh, a name appeared on my list and he was right up near the top, like four or five down. And he was identified as a first cousin. Well, there was a buzz with my family. Who is this person? Why, you know, and I did know it was the paternal side of my family that we'll talk about a little bit about identifying the paternal and maternal sides of your family. I did know that. And the cousins, um, some of them were even contacted by him and wanted to know what, what to do. So I looked into it a little bit uh, closer. I was in touch with him and he told me where he was born and he told me uh, uh, how old he was. So I looked at my 21st cousins because he was a coming across as the first cousin and he was younger, he's the next generation. So he's a first cousin once removed. And I looked at them and, I, and I, I could see probably who it was because I knew where he was born and about what time. So what do I do with this information? This is really private information. And this is also information that may change a person's life. Uh, so I contacted um, his niece and she was, uh, I, she says, oh dear, she said, well, um, she says, I will talk to him. I will share this with him and see what he wants to do. He's not married and he doesn't have children. So she did contact him. He said, please have him call me. Uh, the young man did call him and they've made a connection and it's been a very positive experience. The young man wrote me later and said, I've been looking for my father for 38 years. Thank you so much for connecting me with my father. So that was a positive experience. The second case is where a pregnant mother was abandoned 90 years ago. The father married another and raised a family. 
The children of that father did not know they had a half brother. So this um, pregnant mother had a son. He, he just passed away, he was 90 years old. And the children did a DNA test, he did, took his DNA test. And they found out that there was another family and made a connection, but the family did not want to go that route. They didn't want to know that their father had another child. Went by for a couple of months, and then they did indeed contact this family, and they've been, they live in the Midwest. They've been out to California to meet now. So the children of the father um, have now met the children of, of, of the, uh, the son who had been abandoned 90 years ago. And that's been a positive experience, both through DNA. And the final story I want to share with you um, is, is a, a, something that can happen to any of us. My, my daughter is adopted. Um, and the birth father's family does not know or did not know that she existed. So she got uh, an uh, email. Remember, all the emails with DNA are brokered. That is, only Family Tree DNA actually gives you the, the actual email. They go through the website. And she got um, an email that said, hi, cousin, who are you? So when this happens, um, we just need to know that a parent or a sibling might turn up on your DNA match list that you had no idea existed. Um, first cousins will have the same birth grandparents. And in this case of my daughters, um, this first cousin did have the same birth grandparents. And you'll need to determine when it comes up if it's a maternal or paternal grandparent. Um, so that's, that's something that we'll talk about. If the first cousin matches with other first and second cousins, then you can determine whether it's maternal or paternal match. And I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, you might wanna identify the aunts or un uncles of that first cousin if you can. And those aunts or uncles could be the birth parent. Now here's a, um, a schematic or drawing of just my daughter's situation. I'm gonna call her Barbara Smith. She knows who her mother is, Diane Johnson, but she does not know who her father is. So when this first cousin sent her an email, hey, cousin, who are you? She could see that it was not on her mother's side, her birth mother's side. His name is, was Peter. I've changed all the names. His name was Peter, and he was very interested in who she was because he had not heard anything about her at all. So he started to tell her a little bit about his family. He said his mother's name was Sylvia and that he had three uncles, Joshua, Scott, and Tim. My daughter saw that Linda and Nancy seemed to be the daughter and granddaughter of Scott. So they were identified also as a first cousin. So Peter, Linda is a first cousin, Nancy is a first cousin once removed. So Joshua and Tim, one of them, is very likely her birth father. Of course, it won't, wouldn't be confirmed until they too took a DNA test. But Peter went to Sylvia and said, Mom, would you take a, a DNA test? She said, rather not. Let's just let this go and um, let's, let's move on. Scott, however, must have gotten a DNA testing kit at Christmas. This would be an, an uncle, presumed uncle. And he took the test. And um, of course, Barbara Smith's name appeared on his match list. So he immediately sent an email to Barbara Smith, my daughter. Um, so my daughter has chosen to, to just kind of wait on all of this, but she's learned a lot about this family and uh, she knows where these people exist. And we've certainly done a whole schematic drawing of the various people, the grandparents, et cetera. Um, we know obituaries and all of these things are very helpful. I will say that Facebook is an amazing source of information about a family. And if that is of concern to you, you might look at your privacy settings on Facebook. This family is all over Facebook so that my daughter was able to really find out about a lot of the things this family is doing, which was very interesting. So that's, that are three uh, situations with my family. And um, I know that uh, some of you probably have had some surprises as well. So getting back to the tests, there's three tests. There's the Y-DNA male line, which goes back about 20 generations, um, also gives you a haplogroup. 
And that's nice because you follow the surname. And some people have had very good luck with that. The mitochondrial that goes back the female line, also 20 generations, that's a little trickier because it isn't the, the maiden name changes to a married name and you can't really do it. But people have, you know, who have taken this to this step have found some good things. Mitochondrial appears in daughters and sons, but it's only carried forward by the daughters. The mitochondrial was very um, instrumental in identifying Richard III's remains. You may remember about 10 years ago, um, Richard, there were skeletal remains found in a car park in Leicester in England. And um, they were able with reverse genealogy to take them to his sister's um, descendants and follow them up to people who are living today and take their DNA. And they were able to identify that that was indeed Richard III. So they have been very helpful. But we're going to talk about autosomal, and that's both female and male lines. So autosom autosomal is paternal and maternal, goes back four to six generations, and it identifies DNA pieces, which are called cinemorgans. And it identifies what cinemorgans are the same, and then guesses at a relationship. So it works kind of, these are the five companies that, um, that are currently testing for DNA, uh, a direct to consumer testing. Uh, Ancestry, 23andMe, my heritage, family tree DNA, and living DNA. A uh, one friend who's actually on today um, said that you should, it's probably good to fish in all ponds. I like that expression, that each of these have a different database, different people. And um, if this is something that really interests you, you might want to try it, all of these. So there are five. Ancestry, of course, costs money. Um, about 20 million kits have been tested with Ancestry. And this is good for genealogy matches because there's 20 million kits out there and ethnicity testing. Ancestry, in order to use their bells and whistles, you do need to have some kind of subscription. And there is just a DNA subscription. But with just the matches, it's not as helpful unless you um, can use some of the, 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 um, the, uh, test, the clues, the testing that, that they um, recommend. Family tree DNA is one million cat test, and that offers Y DNA, DNA and mitochondrial testing. So if you wanna go into the deep um, genealogy, that's a good one to use. And some serious uh, genealogists on family tree DNA. 23andMe is 10 million kits. So it's right up there, right behind Ancestry. And if you're interested in your health, that's a very good one. Um, 23andMe has just learned, has just realized that you can't make money selling one kit. So they now have an upgrade uh, where you can learn more about your health. So that's something that they have recently um, offered. And my heritage is with 3.8 million kits. And that is a great one for international matches. If you want to connect with people in Scandinavia, in, in Europe, um, this, it is an Israeli company and it really is used um, quite a bit by uh, European. Um, so this is a good one if you want to explore that. And then last is living DNA. It's fairly new and there's a limited number of kits out there. I couldn't find quite a number, but it's very good if you have British roots. So those are the five ones. If you're just getting started, probably a good way to go is to go with Ancestry. Now, one good thing about this is Ancestry and 23andMe let you transfer their raw data to another database, but they do not allow you to take the raw data from the other groups into their databases. But MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, and Living DNA allow you to transfer raw data from other databases. So a strategy might be is to have your testing with Ancestry and 23andMe or one or the other, and then take that raw data, you download it, and you upload it into MyHeritage or the other ones, and it doesn't cost quite as much. So that's a strategy you can look into. I actually did that with, with some of these. Um, so that's something to think about. Okay, so what do these tests tell us? Well, they tell us about ethnicity. They tell us about, they give us matches, shared matches, and they give us some tools to connect matches with our most common recent ancestor. That is, if we're first cousins, we're gonna have common grandparents. 
um, it helps us figure out how we're related to these people. So here we go. Here's ancestry. This is what three parts of ancestry, the DNA, and we'll look at this a little bit more carefully. You can see that uh, my ethnicity is 50% Swedish. I'm really, my mom was really English and Scottish, but remember the Norwegians were the Norsemen and they came down into Scotland. So that might explain my high percentage of Norway. My dad was definitely 50% Swedish. So ethnicity is interesting. It's fun to talk about. People are interested in that. But it's not the only thing. We want to move into our matches. And then we want to use one of the tools that Ancestry has, which is through lines. And what we're looking at with um, Ancestry, which is very helpful, um, are genetic communities, which are actually more helpful than ethnicity because they break it down using your family tree that you've posted with Ancestry and combining that with your DNA into communities. And Ancestry has from the 1700 to 1950, over 1500 genetic communities. And they're really more useful than ethnicity. So here's mine. This is what it looks like. I have come from England and from and Scotland and from Scandinavia. And one of the things that, and you can see I've broken down, they've broken me down and they're absolutely right. Using my family tree and my DNA, into central Sweden. These are places where my people are. Exactly, Osterbot, Gotland, Easter Barnland, um, Scotland from the Scottish Highlands. This is absolutely correct. And then they've broken it down further into early Connecticut and New York settlers. That's all in keeping with my genealogy research and Southern Minnesota and Wisconsin settlers also in keeping with my genealogy research. So this is very helpful in terms of validating uh, what you've been working on. Okay, so let me just show you this tool that um, I think is really interesting that Ancestry has. Here I am in 1700, and they are again tracking my migrations. They've got me in Europe, coming from England over to uh, Connecticut and New York. 1725, they're moving me up. 1750, they're moving me into um, further south. These, are, these dots are DNA matches. 1775, I'm going a little further. I'm starting to go into Canada actually because I have a loyalist, I have a lo whole loyalist group. So it's really tracking. Notice up here too, they're actually naming the people that made these moves on my family tree, which is very helpful. 1825, I'm going back, I'm going into Wisconsin and Michigan, 1850, starting to got some West Coast, 1875, my family has made the move to the West Coast, to the Bay Area and to um, Hollister, Salinas area. 1900, still doing that, I'm going up to Seattle, I've got people in Seattle, 1925, um, we're going to LA, 1950, we're in the California area. So this is an amazing um, uh, tool that Ancestry offers in the migration of our people. And what they've done is created genetic communities. So let's move now to shared matches, which is se that second um, thing that I was showing. Shared matches are the centimorgans or percentage that represent relationships. And we probably want to really explore a fourth cousin or better, which would be about five generations with autosomal DNA. And we want to explore if they share an ancestor location, ancestor surname. These shared matches all give us tips, insights into our family. I, I look at DNA as a tossed green salad. Because. Everyone has different DNA. Some have more tomatoes than others. Some have more raisins or nuts. Some have more cucumbers. But generally, we can say that a brother and sister have 50% of shared of their DNA and share 50% with a father or a mother, a daughter, niece. This are, these are all percentages that will appear on your DNA charts. And they give us clues about the relationship of that match to you. So what you do, and making simplifying this, but at least this is a process, 
you select a known match and probably someone that's the oldest relative on your list of matches because that's somebody who can help get you closer to your most recent common ancestor. So you want to determine how you're connected to that person. Do you have the same grandparents? Do you have the same great grandparents? And then you utilize the shared matches tool. It's best to start with someone you know, a cousin, someone you know, because you know exactly where they are on your, on your chart. So then you utilize the shared matches tool and you create a genetic network. The genetic network is that family that you're researching. And you confirm the centimorgans to determine the cousin relationships within that genetic network. And then you do the genealogy, which we all do, the research. So that's the steps. So let's, let's go through the steps. I go to my DNA matches and you see I have 589 fourth cousins or closer and I have thousands that they've put in there. I usually try and stay above 20 centimorgan sharing. I don't usually go too much lower than that. But in some cases you want to when you're really serious about looking at uh, distant ancestors. Okay, so here's my matches, or at least some of them. And I've selected, I've chosen for privacy reasons, the names, but I've selected a cousin named Ingrid, who is my genealogy buddy. And I know exactly where she is on my family tree. She is a first cousin once removed. And she has 440 centimorgans, and she has a public link tree. So you, two things you want to look for is uh, how many centimorgans they share with you, percentage of shared DNA, and whether or not they have a tree, that makes it easier. Now, you know, as you get into it more, you um, will want to contact people who don't have a public tree. But to start out, pick people who have a tree. So that's Ingrid. Okay, so I go into Ingrid, I click on Ingrid's view match, and I see that we share great grandparents. So this genetic network that I am looking at is my Nystrom network, one of my Swedes, my maternal grandmothers, uh, my pater paternal side, but it's um, my, my grandmother on the paternal side. So Ingrid has, we share uh, great grandparents and I can see exactly where we are on our tree. Now, if I go over a little further, I can see what matches Ingrid and I share with other people on my list. And that tells me that they're probably other Nystroms this genetic network that I'm creating uh, of Nystroms. So I go and hit shared matches. And here I am, here's another person, public link tree, 64 people. And they're also a first and second cousin. They do have more centimorgans than, than Ingrid has. So I'm gonna view that one. Now this person shares grandparents with me. So this is really a first cousin, this person and a little bit about who they are. And I can sort of figure out this person who where this person fits in my tree as well. Now Ingrid is 440 sentiment organs and the other first cousin was 547. Um, this is a chart that I think this is Izog that I got this from, which is an organization, a DNA organization. And you can see that um, where they are is a first cousin or first cousin once removed. That sort of gives me a ballpark figure where these people are, just based on the number of centimorgans they have. Now, there's a wonderful little tool that is called DNA Painter. These are just, again, I'm throwing these out, and if this is something you want to explore further, please make it jot down a note of, of what these are. The DNA Painter is um, a third-party uh, DNA site. And what is great about this is you can put in up here in this box how many centimorgans you have. And I'm going to put 440 in, which is Ingrid. And it shows me that these are the possibilities with 440 chrome, uh, centimorgans overlapping, with the overlapping of our DNA, that she is one of these things. Well, I know she's not a great great aunt because she's my age. I know she's not an uncle. She's basically in my, my age range. Uh, she's not going to be a niece or nephew. So she's probably going to be in the half great aunt, uncle, half first cousin. She is a first cousin once removed. So it gives you options. You have to look at it a little bit more closely to figure out exactly where it is. But it gives you a ballpark area. And this is a, a great site. DNA Painter, it's called. So now we do the genealogy. 
and we try and figure out, you see my nystrums are over there on the side. Uh, this is my nystrum family. My family is a little bit more confusing because I do have three siblings that married three siblings. So the Swedes are a little bit more confused, but this is the nystrum group. And so now I wanna put those nystrum people into um, my family tree. And that's a genetic network. The companies have, three of the companies have tools that help us, give us clues. They're not always right. They're not, you know, we have to take them with a grain of salt, but I have found wonderful connections with these tools. Ancestry has through lines. My heritage has a theory of relativity and 20 and three in me has family tree. So remember we saw this first part, through lines is a third part of ancestry. And what they do is they've taken my family tree and they've identified these different people in my family tree. And you can see here's Jacob Victor Nystrom, who's my great grandfather, the Nystrom person. Now, if I go into my website here and I look at these various people, here's my grandfather, here's Jacob Victor. They say that I have 11 DNA matches that match with this genetic um, wet network that I'm, I'm interested in. And that's very helpful. It really takes a lot of the uh, work out of it. At least I can explore and see if these are possibilities. So if I get back to this and I go to Jacob Victor Nystrom, I can see that my through lines, which ancestry has done for me, has created um, for my different great uncles and aunts. They say that there are three DNA matches that are direct descendants of Elmer Nystrom, three that are direct descendants of David Nystrom, two that are of Jenny, and here's my grandmother, and there's some direct descendants. And here I am, here's my father, and there's some direct descendants here. So these are all people that are in that Nystrom genetic network. And Ancestry has given me some clues, some things to pursue, because it's already placed and, and often correctly, sometimes incorrectly, DNA matches where they think they would be. It's amazing. They've taken my tree and they've taken my DNA and they put this together for me. My heritage has the theory of relativity. And you can see up here with DNA matches, here's DNA, DNA matches. It's a similar kind of thing. Here's my uh, ethnicity. They're, they're a little bit closer. They're giving me more English here, still Scandinavian. Interesting, the Finnish, my uh, Swedish family settled in a little town called uh, Finnerusia, settled by Finns. And that's why I have that two, probably very likely why I have that 2.4% Finnish. Um, anyway, here we are, DNA matches. I click on that. And here's my matches for my heritage, similar. But down here, one of these has a theory of relativity. And if I review that match, they've set it up for me. They've told me, my maiden name was Anderson. They've told me um, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. This person is a second cousin twice removed, uh, the grandson of a, of a second cousin there. And they've suggested that's a possibility. And they're absolutely right on this. A second cousin twice removed. We're second cousins, two generations below would be the remove. And then you, what you do is you, um, you go to the next, your, your, the next generation and you count this one, I'm gonna go back, you count this one, two, twice removed. So they were absolutely right on that. Um, this is 23andMe. Now they don't have my family tree. They only are going on my DNA, totally. And they allow you to write in, they give you the, the opportunity to write in names here. But here I am and here's my mother and father. And here's my grandparents on my mother's side. My, they, they have said that there is a brother there or there is a sibling, which is correct, my uncle. And then they've taken it down one, two, three generations. These are people that are the descendants of my uncle who are related to me. And I can explore these various people. This is on my uh, paternal side. I can explore these various people and see what my connection is. They're actually quite right on this one. And this is not anything to do with my family tree. This is totally based on my DNA. 
it's amazing how they can figure this out. They figure out that my mother has a sibling and that there are three and four generations of people who have submitted DNA who are related to me. Here I am. So that's another technique. And you can indeed put all the names in. Uh, it's not always perfectly correct, but it certainly gives you some clues. So it's overwhelming. What ancestral line do you want to research? I mean, there's so many. So my advice is to focus on one genetic network. And in the case that I showed you, I was focusing on the Nystrom's. I was not getting confused with the other matches that I had. You start with a known match and you look for shared matches. You look for shared matches that have a family tree and a common ancestor. So then you know you're working within that genetic network. And you use, you use the DNA tools that are given for you. And you build a family tree. You do the genealogy. So why do we go to all this trouble? I mean, we're going to do a lot of trouble with this expense too, because we want to connect with cousins who have information on our families. And these cousins have family trees that they've researched, photographs perhaps, family Bibles, diaries, journals, letters, address books, and all kinds of other documents. These are treasures, and these we would love to get our hands on to help us find more about our, our, our uh, family and to break up some brick walls. But sometimes they just don't respond. Maybe they've just gotten this as a kit for Christmas, and they just want their ethnicity, and they, they really aren't interested. So Amy Johnson Crow, who is a podcaster that I listen to, her podcast is called G Generations Cafe, suggests that cousins don't respond because your match is only interested in eth ethnicity, they want to say they're Swedish, and they want to not connect with you. Uh, your match is an adoptee and doesn't even know what their family is all about. Your match is a total surprise. I didn't even know you existed. And the relationship may not be very close, and they just don't know about their fourth cousins. And your message may be too generic. So introduce yourself. Include the relationship. Name those common ancestors that you think you might have with that person that you've picked up from these sharing tools. Show that you're doing some research and indicate that you want to work with them, that you want to collaborate. And you're not just asking for information that you really want to roll up your sleeves and work with them. But you must be sensitive to the fact that they might not be interested and they've not done any research. So Diane Southern, I love what Diane Southern says. She says, writing to um, a potential cousin is like a first date. You don't want to give too much information, but you want to give enough just to make it interesting. Um, many years since I worried about a first date, but you know, that, that's probably good advice. Dear Donald, I am the great granddaughter of Anders Petter Anderson and Friederike Johann's daughter. They immigrated in 1880 from Sweden to North Dakota and then Kingsburg. I believe we may be related. Might you be willing to share the names of your grandparents or your family tree if you have one? I certainly understand if you do not have time to share information. Please let me know if you receive this note. Thank you. So something that gives enough information, but not overwhelming. Don't overwhelm them with all. Now, I want to just quickly say there are other great tools. I'm not going to go into detail with them, but um, these are things that you also will want to use as you do your search. And one is chromosome browsing. Another is the auto cluster. And the third one is another one is uh, what are the odds, which is with DNA painter. And a fourth one is GEDmatch, which is a third, third party um, DNA site. And I just, just to show you basically how these work, the chromosome browser lets you see how your DNA segments are shared between a genetic match and you. And MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, GEDmatch, and 23andMe all have chromosome browsing. And it's very, very helpful. It looks like this. This is um, 23andMe. And this is my cousin Ingrid again, and another cousin, Sharon. And you can see that, and they're part of the Nystrom genetic network. You can see where we overlap. It's a visual to see where of your 23 chromosomes you share a match. So if in fact I find another match that has similar crossover on one, I can explore further whether or not they're a nice term as well. So that is um, 
That is chromosome browsing. Auto clustering is where you throw in the raw DNA and the program, the algorithm, puts together genetic networks. So that first block may be my nystrom. That second might be um, my Monroe. The third might be my Johann's daughter, Johann's, Johansson's. It's a way of grouping people together. And if you're doing research on a specific genetic network, it really helps you sift through your matches. But a very easy way to do that is with my heritage. My heritage has an automatic autocluster. They take your matches, they put them together. And um, I do, these are people I don't know. And this is, again, I was saying how my heritage is largely European. This is a Scandinavian really contacts with people in Scandinavia. Uh, auto clustering. DNA painter, painter offers what are the odds. This is where they make a hypothesis based on what you think your tree is and where people fit in. And it's, again, another sophisticated tool to use. So I'm just sharing those three things with you so that if you want to pursue learning about them, you know the names to, to look into. So let's go into GEDmatch. GEDmatch definitely been in the news. GEDmatch has been responsible for identifying the Golden State Killer, the NorCal Rapist in the 1990s, and that young couple in Washington State, and, 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 and many others, many other crimes that have been cold cases for 50 years. Um, Curtis Rogers is the one who developed it with his colleague, John Olson. They lived, they, their office was in this yellow bungalow with uh, green trim. And what they wanted to do was set up a third party website where you could upload your raw data from any of the companies that we talked about. And it would give you a bigger pond to fish in. And it was an advantage if you didn't have testing with each company because 23andMe people can throw their raw data in there, Ancestry people can, and it really expanded your opportunities. And it's called GEDmatch. But what happened was um, the forensic, you know, the law enforcement and forensic investigators decided that to use GEDmatch and to put in the, the actual DNA of potential uh, people who were perpetrators of crimes. And they threw this into GEDmatch. In fact, one of our local people was very involved in the Golden State Killer case and a, a crew of volunteers who helped her with that. Um, were able to figure out who this killer or who the suspects might be. GEDmatch was, it was a lot of criticism of GEDmatch because people said, wait a minute, I put my, my DNA in there, but I didn't want it to use it to find a criminal or to implicate any of my family members. So GEDmatch has had to change its terms of service, which is a reminder, terms of services are just constantly changing. And the method used in GEDmatch is actually shared in this amazing mystery, if you're a mystery reader, the Chester Creek murders, the Venator cold case. Nathan Dillon Goodwin is um, an English um, detective writer. He writes about genetic mysteries. And this one really talks about how forensic genealogy works and how law enforcement is using forensic genealogy. I recommend this because it talks about how your genetic networks are created and how you figure out who is where. And um, I couldn't put this book down. I, I just, I stayed up too late reading it. Um, okay, law enforcement tools. Okay, this is what law enforcement has at this point. They have CODIS, and that's the DNA base created by um, law enforcement. And there's about 16 million, as of 2018, DNA profiles, probably many more now. The problem with this, if the person is not in CODIS, it really can't be used. If they were never caught, then their DNA was never put into CODIS. But this is the law enforcement uh, database. There's also a Department of Defense DNA registry, which, is, which uh, law enforcement has access to. And we would hope that there wouldn't be too many criminals in that in that database, but that is also of use to law enforcement. What law enforcement does is they send their DNA that has been uh, uh, gotten at the crime scene, and they send it to a company called Parabon Nano Labs, which does much of the law enforcement testing. Um, and they have, uh, have, they've uploaded to GEDmatch as of 2018, about 200 perpetrator profiles, and I don't have a recent count of that. 
But um, Parabon Analabs is the one that does the DNA testing for law enforcement. They don't have Ancestry do the testing or 23andMe. But they take Parabon Nanolabs and they put it and put it into GenWrench. Okay, so here's how it works. They upload that profile, which is the DNA from a crime scene that they have had in their evidence. Uh, and they upload it to GenMatch. Now, Family Tree DNA is also allowing law enforcement testing. So there's also their terms of service have changed as well. They, you can opt out of it. You can still post your, your uh, DNA on these sites and you can opt out of, of having law enforcement testing it, but be sure and look at that and consider that. They sort the autosomal DNA matches and they estimate the number of generations to the most common ancestor. And then they triangulate a common ancestor and they develop a family tree using the family trees and the DNA matches, sort of on a more sophisticated level of what I was sharing you with my Nystrom network. And then they go in and they do the genealogy research and they go into obituaries and birth and marriage and land records. And they have a whole tree of this family of many generations and many lines. And in the cases of the criminal investigations, they research the family trees of matches until they find someone who might fit the profile of the killer, at least what the law enforcement already knows. They can actually, you know, they can tell hair color, eye color, ethnicity, and then you start to narrow it down. And they develop a list of suspects, but they've got to confirm that that suspect um, DNA matches the sample. So in the case of the Golden State Killer, um, that suspect tossed uh, a coffee cup into the trash can and he was being watched by the police at this time as, as a suspect. They retrieved the coffee cup and it, bingo, it matched the DNA um, of the evidence from the crime scene. The question is, how is this, where is it going and what's gonna happen? Well, Lisa Louise Cook, another podcaster has said, it is a wild, wild west right now in this world of DNA. Nothing is guaranteed. There's ethical issues, relatives have become informants unbeknownst to them. And the reality is that any decision to have our DNA tested impacts all members of our family. There's privacy issues. Is the law enforcement invading our privacy? So our dilemma, which is our dilemma in life really in the 21st century, um, but certainly with genealogists, is how to share information with cousins and get results and how to avoid risks that are involved in sharing that information. They have a lot of our information, these companies. They know our ethnicity. They know how we're related to other test takers. They know about our physical and health traits. And they actually have access to personal data in our profile. They have our email, they have our credit cards. They have a lot of information about us. There are some laws that protect us. There's the GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. There is a California law, SB 559. And Florida and California passed laws to regulate how testing companies can use, sell, and share genetic information. You may have seen that 60-minute episode a couple of months ago about the data mining of, of these um, organizations. So um, there are some protections, but laws change, as we know, and they're interpreted differently. But that's where it is now. We do have some protections. So we are correct to have concerns. We can be hacked. People can profit from our DNA. Are these laws broad enough? Do they cover life insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance? What is the future role of law enforcement with DNA? And a company's policy may change. Ancestry's policy to terms of service just changed in terms of uh, use of, of the information that you put into Ancestry. Um, Ancestry has been bought by, um, uh, has been sold several times and each time a new company buys, one of these companies, they change, they change, make changes. So we've got to be on top of that and just know, be happy with what we're doing. But law enforcement looks like um, DNA is going to be working in court cases because um, the Golden State Killer, we'll see what happens there. Um, I believe the NorCal Rapist one, they did use DNA um, evidence. So the courts will decide how effective this is in um, actually. Um, catching uh, these various uh, perpetrators. GEDmatch and family DNA do allow law enforcement 
If you're interested in this topic, I recommend Judy Russell. She's a legal genealogist and she's following it all the time. So she's someone that you might want to um, look at her blogs. And she always gives a, a very um, a good analysis of what's happening with the law and genealogy. So things to consider. Consider whether you want to have your DNA tested. Weigh the positive with the negative. If you have tested, explore the options on your company's website and be sure and read the terms of service and the informed consent pages. Informed consent pages are whether you want your DNA used in, in uh, health uh, testing or, or whatever. 23andMe, of course, is an example of that. Final thought, the only way to be safe is not to take a DNA test. It's just like the only way not to get in a car accident is not to get into a car. So it's up for to us to take responsibility. There's no guarantee that anything we put online is private. We all know that. So we need to weigh the advantages of sharing information with the disadvantages. And that, that's our dilemma. That's the challenge of the 21st century. But that said, DNA is the key to solving many brick walls. It's helped adoptees find their birth parents from very positive situations. It's introduced us to wonderful cousins that we didn't know exist. I've just met some wonderful people through DNA. Actually, I met them in person and had nice correspondences with them. And it's helped us solve cold cases that go back nearly 50 years, which is really a positive. But I want to just conclude with a positive thought. Um, and this is Living DNA, that, that new DNA site, the fifth one that I told you about, that's just up, up and coming. They have a motto. We are all made up of all of us. And what I like about Living DNA, what they have done is they have gone in schools and with parents' permission, have tested the DNA of students who want to participate. And they've shown how kids, how we're all alike. Our DNA is all alike, depending, it doesn't matter what the color of our skin is or where we're from, our DNA is all alike. And this last picture, this was a school in England, Brookfield School, where they had a whole unit on testing. They've also done it in the United States too. Um, Diane Souther's been involved with that. But this last bottom picture is two families, um, a, a girl of Indian descent and a girl of English descent, and they've just opened their DNA results and they found out that they have a common ancestor. They are cousins. And the schools that have actually implemented this program have found that bullying has decreased, that there hasn't been the same kind of um, bullying. So I wanted to just end with something positive and uh, Living DNA is doing um, a lot of education with DNA. Um, two books I recommend are um, two authors are Blaine Bettinger and Diane Southern. If you're looking for more information on DNA, they both have blogs and, and speak all over the, the country. And I hope that I'll see you next month um, for All Things Relative. We're gonna talk about every home has a story next month. And I've done some research on my home and I wanna share my research from Carmel Valley, what I found out about my home, which I found to be um, really interesting and connect me even further to my home and to um, great grandparents who had a, a ranch in Prunedale. I'm gonna talk about that. In fact, the Monterey Public Library, the Car California, one of the most popular questions that the California History Room gets is, help me research my home. So I'm gonna help you just show you how you can do that. And then in October, we're gonna talk about what we're gonna do with all of our stuff, our heirlooms and our research. How can we make sure that it will be carried on and honored? So those are the next two things coming up. And again, contact Sean and contact me. I'm happy to answer any questions. And I look forward to seeing if you have any questions in chat. And I look forward in, for, to hearing about um, some of the, the experts here that have, might have some comments to make. Okay, I'll turn it back to you, Sean. Well, thank you, Kathy. That was, that was really, really good. Uh, we have a couple questions that are in the chat. Um, this is referring to the migration page that you um, showed yes, in the, the National earlier. Geographic. Um, the migration, is it separated out on the different sides of your family? Uh, yes, it is. well, it will be your maternal and paternal. So you will have um, a, a, a maternal, uh, your mitochondria will have one haplogroup in your, um, if you are a male, you will have, your YDNA will have um, a haplogroup as well. Yes. 
And they're not every company does that. It's just um, really family tree DNA is the main one. Maybe the rest, if any of you know, is there another one that does haplogroups besides family tree DNA? Okay, alrighty. Any other questions? Yes, so this one, I'm looking for my husband's biological father and, and have no known matches. He did join family tree DNA. Any suggestions on how to proceed? So they're looking for your, your, their husband's biological father and there are no known matches. Well, I would, I actually would try another DNA test because there may be something like that, that point that uh, Gail made about fishing in lots of ponds. There may be something in another way. And actually GEDmatch might be another possibility. Do uh, Jim or Patricia, do you have any thoughts on that you'd like to add? To Janelle's, just, Janelle's on too, yeah. I would just concur that um, to test at maybe 23andMe or Ancestry.com, they have the biggest um, set of um, you know customers, and so you'd be more apt to find matches at those two places. I yeah. I agree. Um, uh, he needs to be in all of the databases, and um, Ancestry is probably because it's the largest one is probably the place to start. Great. Thank you. Also, also, I might recommend uh, with Ancestry that you start looking at the dot method uh, for separating them out. Because once you, once you find one network, it's very easy to find the others. Yes, and um, what Patricia is referring to, we didn't uh, look at that, but when you go, if you are, do have uh, your testing with Ancestry, be sure and look at those dots that are on the right hand side, you can color code them according to your genetic group, your genetic network. So my Nystroms that I decide are Nystroms are color coded with a certain color, and it's really helpful, plus you can make notes about who all these people are. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, the DNA Geek is uh, D the DNA Geek.com has an excellent uh, blog on using those uh, color dots. Very simple, very easy to get started. Do you want to put oh, that in the chat, Patricia? Um, I will try. I've got to, I've got to go because I've got another okay. meeting. But um, okay. yes, uh, but also my heritage just announced that they are going to go with the dots also. Great. They're Great. going to they're going to start providing 24 different color dots. Great. Um, so um, that's going to help a lot. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Well, good to see you, Patricia. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Sean. Another question. I know it's getting late. Yes. <clears throat> uh, the next question is: um, First, will these slides be available later? if someone would like to access the slides that you used in your presentation? Oh, well, it will be, Sean will be putting this up on, um, on the YouTube channel for the Monterey Public Library. So you'll be able to see the presentation again. If you are interested in, in a certain slides or anything, please just email me and, and I can work that out with you. That'd be fine. And you saw my email, email at the end there. knielsen68 at gmail.com. And it should be up on the YouTube page later next week or early the following week. Um, just depends on how fast I can get it up there. Um, another question, what is a DNA site's culpability if their data is hacked, but users haven't agreed to let in their the relative's DNA be used to solve crimes? Well, they are, they are responsible, you know, they, they would be held responsible. We haven't seen any hacking of a site at this point. Um, so I, my advice to you would be not to put anything up there that you don't want up there in terms of being hacked. So uh, we haven't seen that at all yet, but that is certainly a possibility. And I would think that the hacking that would be, uh, you know, all of us are identified by a number, it's not our name. So this, any DNA that's being shared within the company is a number that's identified. So there is some privacy along that line. But we have, just don't put something that you feel is, is too sensitive up there. And you might have already addressed this. The following question after that is, what are your takes on this? And will Web 3.0 abbreviate or increase risk? Oh, that's a whole nother 
idea, boy, we've got to talk about that in our DNA <laughs> group. 3.0 web is going to make, they're, they're not regulations, they're not really, it is a wild, wild west. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with that. I, I don't know. Um, um, my son has really been exploring this one. So uh, I look forward to learning more about 3.0 web and an opportunity for us to store data um, unlimited but there won't be the same kinds of constraints that we have now with web 2.0. Okay, good question. And that's all the questions that are in the chat. If the if anyone would like to ask a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask ask Kathy. Any 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 other questions? It's great to see you all, and uh, from all parts of my life, I I love this. Um, and I hope to see you next month when we're talking about our homes. And I hope that you will bring some of your ideas and questions as well. So I look forward to seeing you next month. And Sean, thank you for hosting us. Thank you so much, Kathy, for spending some time with us. Greatly appreciate it. And, and thanks, um, everyone, for being here. It's great. And like Kathy mentioned, we'll be doing this next month. We'll be talking about the homes, history of our homes. And um, I look forward to seeing you all. Thank you all for spending uh, this afternoon with us. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Take care. Sean, could you send me the chat, a copy of the chat? Yes, I will. That'd be great. Okay. I'll see you all. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for sharing. Thank you, everyone. Bye.